All right, hello, hello, hello. So, welcome to In Depth Crypto. Um, if you're new to the channel or new to In Depth Crypto or new to the project in general, um, basically, oh, let me just move myself here. Um, basically, In Depth Crypto is a video series and or a podcast where um, I go over kind of like I think of it as applied cryptocurrencies, where um, I'm talking about how cryptocurrencies can be used within the business environments, financial environments, and also um, uh, well, business, financial, and economic environment. That's, that's the third one. And essentially, it's going to be a little different than the typical uh, cryptocurrency and, uh, analysis channel where they just go over, you know, whether or not Bitcoin's going to go up or down or you know, those type of surface level things. So um, it's important for you guys to watch this if you're or if you're considering the, or if you're inside the um, Discord or inside the Watch Earn project, because this is the framework that I'm have, that I have for, um, the project moving forward and since it's it, since its inception essentially so um the washer and project is basically just a demonstration of all of these core fundamentals so it's important for you guys to understand this and also this is just this is literally coming from my head so this is not from anyone else or anything like that so literally this is the only place that you're going to be able to uh, see such uh, information so um take that as you will so uh what else what else is there anything more i do not think so so we're gonna go into the go to the presentation here. All right. Concept of financial density. Financial density is a concept that different forms of revenue each have their respective unique properties that aren't found uniformly across all forms of revenue. This thus means that each form of revenue has unique strengths and weaknesses when compared to other revenue forms when analyzing business strategy. So donations, taxes, royalties, subscriptions, commissions, fees, etc., can be thought of in a similar manner to chlorine, oxygen, carbon, helium, and sodium in chemistry, or iron, plastic, wood, oil, glass, or cotton in engineering. So, because the uh, uh, because revenue forms have a similar relationship to the aforementioned examples, my hypothesis is that by understanding the characteristics of said revenue forms, you can structurally understand how a business could fail or succeed with precise accuracy. The same way we know what happens with baking soda and vinegar in the classic science experiments. So when I say um, um, could fail or succeed, that just basically means um, it could be either internally um, with an internal analysis or, com or comparing a business to another uh, business or, or comparing it to a competitor. So this presentation is going to be comparing a business with competitors, but be aware that it could also be just in one singular uh, internal analysis. So. The density of a revenue form is denoted with a score between 0 and 10, from low density to high density. Examples of revenue forms with a density score of 0 are donations, tips, panhandling revenues, street performance revenues, etc. Examples of revenue forms with a density score of 10 are taxes, jail bonds, medical fees, government contracts, debts, government subsidy, infrastructure fees, and utility fees. So, what's important to note here is that just because one side is, uh, has a lesser density score than another doesn't mean that, you know, one company might make more in donations than another does in, um, let's say, medical fees or in, in, in debt interest or interest repayments and stuff like that. Um, just so the example here is like, you know, the common saying where, you know, it was what, what weighs more, 100 pounds of feathers or 100 pounds of iron? And obviously, it's a true question. Is they're, they equal the same amount of weight? But in terms of density, obviously, 100 pounds of iron could probably fit in, you know, one hand, or you know, maybe in a maybe like this or something like that. But 100 pounds of feathers, you know, might take up an entire room. So it just tells tells you the different attributes and the lightness and whatnot. So you'll you'll understand this as the uh, presentation moves forward. So, all right. So what you'll notice is that the higher density revenue forms typically come from organizations that are able to use force or no other option um, as, a, as, 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 as a reason for keeping uh, customers. And so um, these organizations typically have goods or services that have an inelastic demand curve, which means that increases in price have little effect on demand. So let's just look for this. Um, organizations, organizations are able to use force, taxes. If you don't pay your taxes, you're going to jail. You have to pay them. Jail bonds with no other option, you're in jail. You know, if you can't pay the entire bond, more than likely you're going to try to go to a a, um, a bail bondsman or whatnot. So that's a no other option. Medical fees, um, you have no choice to pay for medicine. You know, if you really need medicine, if you need insulin, if you need a you know inhaler, or whatever, you have no other choice. Um, 
interest repayments on debts. You know, you have no other choice. They're legally enforced. So that's kind of that's kind of uh, what, what I'm talking about there. Next slide. Oops. Let's see. All right. High density uh, revenue models tend to do uh, tend oh, whoops, tend to be considered safer um, than their low density counterparts. So think of energy stocks being safer versus just regular tech stocks. Um, these organizations also tend to have enormous economies of scale uh, or just outright public sector entities with few to no legal or private sector counterparts. So for example, um, depending where you live, your energy company might only be um, a public company. So it might be ran by the states or ran by the country, wherever you're at. Whereas, you know, I guess in certain places, they might have private energy or uh, private um, garbage collecting, while others might be public. So that's kind of what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about there. So while high density organizations are considered safer, their customer bases are the most fickle. And I discovered that there's a nearly perfect inverse relationship between revenue density and customer loyalty. And customer loyalty or just customer behavior and customer based behavior, I guess you could say, which also includes loyalty. So um, my hypothesis is that if a business entity can provide a good or service at the same quality, speed, convenience, et cetera, you know, whatever uh, attributes are needed, um, at a lower density than its competitor or competitors, they'll structurally overtake their competitor over the long run. So my my assumption is that you'll be able to predict that within a medium term or the long term, so they're unspecified, but within economics, um, if you know, that just means um, middle distance or future distance from, from now in time uh, uh, without any like specific time dates, I guess. So I'm just saying that basically, if you're able to make it where you're not, it's not a force or it's not a... Um, no other option but making it as lesser lesser density um, as you can you're basically set up to win structurally as in like in a dna encoded like there's no other way option uh for it assuming that yet again you're providing the same good or service with the same quality speed and convenience as the competitor or competitors so economics all else being equal et cetera, et cetera. so low density revenue forms are considered uh, the least safe and the most unpredictable Typically, these organizations have to make routine fundraising attempts and rely on the good nature of the public to keep the business afloat. Um, despite the difficulty, successful low-density organizations have the highest customer loyalty and tend to outlast the vast majority of higher-density organizations. So, for example, um, let's say here um, donations, right? Um, or, I mean, let's say tips. Uh, we can say here. So, um we say tips in, in in church, for example. You know, you would say tips. In, well, tips for in a restaurant, for example, might not be as lucrative as, for example, tips in a in a church, where the success of the organization uh, matters between there. Um, donations as well. Um, if we look at typically, if you're just relying on donations, hey guys, can you please donate some Bitcoin for me? More likely, I'll be getting zero dollars and zero cents. However, as we're gonna see in the future, um, or a little bit later in this um, presentation. Um, we have uh, organizations such as the Red Cross, which have existed for like 140 years solely off of donations. So it's when they're successful, they tend to have the highest customer loyalty and tend to outlast the vast majority of uh, their higher density uh, counterparts, essentially. So myself here. So examples of high density um, organizations and industries include Saudi Aramco, which is an oil company in Saudi Arabia, which is that I'm pretty sure that that's their national um, company, um, either their national or it's pretty much like a Samsung and South Korea situation, but I'm not entirely sure. But regardless, it's worth roughly $2 trillion and it's in the utility section. So yet again, this is um, kind of a no other option type of thing. You, you need oil and that's what it is. So and you need oil such energy. So Big Pharma, which is in medicine, worth roughly 880, oh, sorry, $808 billion in the United States in 2021, and it's in the healthcare, which is you know no other option um, example. And then bail bond services, and again, incarceration, um, only worth $1.9 billion in the United States. Um, and I think this was of 2020, 2021, give or take, um, but only 8,881 um, bail bonds uh, company uh, exists, which gives you an average of 214K per year. On average, so even though that's the case, even though the industry is smaller, um, you know the the business nature of it. There's pretty much a hundred percent certainty that there's going to be future customers. You're going to almost ten thousand um, percent rely on people going to jail. So 
um, you never have to worry about, you know, for example, like a donut shop or an ice cream shop or something like that if people are willing to come and whatnot. Um, so there's a near 100% certainty of future customers, and there's also preventative measures to ensure minimal losses, such as collateral, tracking monitors, physical check-ins. Um, they also have um, bail insurance as well. I didn't even know that when I was researching this. So, And that industry is called the justice industry or prison industry, I guess it would be. So, um, yeah, so th those show you of high, this is, these are examples of high density organizations and industries. Um, whereas, try my best to to uh, to do this, but it was, it was too hard to uh, place myself, uh, to consider myself for every single slide. Anyway, so examples of low density organizations and industries include um, for example, the, Amer the American Red Cross, which is for humanitarian aid, um, it made $2.7 billion in terms of our revenue and also uh, donations in 2017 are relying on most, um, according to them, mostly uh, public contributions. So it's existed for 141 years, while only 30% of businesses um, typically only last past 10 years and they're in the healthcare industry. So in the same way, Big Pharma is in the health industry or healthcare industry, so is um, the Red Cross. But obviously um there are two different sides of the, of the density scale and so yeah yet again I, as i said um lower density um businesses are harder to create and harder to run successfully but if they do they tend to outlast far more so than their um than their competitors because the customer base tends to be very very loyal and that's and that's why so uh or customer base or contributors whatever you want to call them so again um, another example is Wikipedia, so encyclopedic knowledge. So they made only 153 million in donations in 2021, but it's ranked number seven on, on top of all websites, which beats WhatsApp, which beats Netflix, which beats Amazon, which beats TikTok, whatever, and it's in the education sector. So it's a low density part of education, while it's a high density, higher density, maybe not necessarily 10, but it would be like tuition based, so secondary education um, universities. Those would be higher based on that scale of density within education. So, um, there's many examples of low density um, organizations or revenue forms uh, beating high density counterparts, but for time's sake, I'll name two. So this, these ones are gonna be the first one and there's gonna be another one as well. So encyclopedia, encyclopedia um, and it's not actually like this, it spells something as different, slightly different, but it is what it is, but it's like a PDF Britannica. Um, oh yes, it's spelled like that. I don't know how to do that. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and I give it an 8.5 density, was selling CD-ROMs of its 32-volume encyclopedia for $1,200 in 1994, which today is literally double, so it's $2,400. So one, that's insane, just think about inflation, but anyway. Also, could you imagine paying $2,400 for a limited amount of um uh books only like what 32 volumes and they, it doesn't update could you imagine doing that today that's insane so um it has a high density because people had no other choice to access such detailed information at the convenience of their own home and were thus forced to pay um that much for information that they couldn't update it said that 100 and 100 units were sold during the company's peak around 1990 in the united states so um yeah um its peak was 1990 so they say the start of the modern or of the um, everyday person internet was 1995 with windows 95 but um regardless you know we're talking about the 80s 70s 60s you know you, uh, and i was talking to my mom about this for um for um research but it's just you know you had to go to the library if, if you didn't want to do if if you want to research and the whole point is that not everyone lived right close to a library or maybe it cost or maybe it's too far away or whatever and this was as good as you can get in terms of having all this information within your own um, household. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, paying $2,400 equivalent isn't because, you know, the paper and the and the stitching cost $2,400, but just based on the scenario, that's what it was. So that's why I said no other choice, hence why is it 8.5 density out of 10. So my example now of Wikipedia, which in my opinion has a 0.0, .0 density, has currently 6.6 .6 million English articles alone, but then in total, they have 57.4 million total pages. So I guess across all of um, all the different languages and whatnot, which is accessed by 45 million registered users. I didn't even know I had that many registered users because I never registered for Wikipedia ever. But um, and it's used and they, everyone uses it for 100% free and it's been around since 2001. 
So it's so this is an example of because of the density scores, you see very easily how Wikipedia is able to beat um, Encyclopedia Britannica. So um, so in reference to these two companies, um, obviously digital is more practical than physical. But my hypothesis is that very specifically because Wikipedia had or has a low density revenue form, it was able to conquer Encyclopedia Britannica and the online com and the online competitors at the time, which from what I looked up were Encarta and Britannica Online. Um, so what's interesting to point out is that Microsoft's Encarta and Britannica Online uh, were both services that people had to pay for. So they had higher densities, which were in the three to five range, than Wikipedia, which was free from its inception. inception. Now, it seems virtually impossible for a competitor to ever be Wikipedia for the foreseeable future. Even the crypto alternative Everpedia made from, some, made from some people from the original Wikipedia team. So um, yeah, so when I was researching this, I was like, Obviously, you know, Wikipedia took over from the actual physical um, encyclopedias, but obviously there had to be some type of middle ground between them. And so, yeah, so British Britannica, or not British Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, I believe it was in 94, um, they, they introduced um, Britannica online. So that's when they started putting all their encyclopedias online. But then also, um, but they're, they're still charging, I think, 1200 Yeah, like, like I said, $1,200 for the CD version of that, which is insane. Could you imagine paying $1,200, $2,400 for a CD that's insane. But then also with uh, Microsoft and Carta, you know, I guess they also offered, um, you had to pay a subscription fee of some sort. So that's why even though it was online, which is a um, lower density than I guess, um, or it's a it's an easier medium, obviously, with, the, with all the information than physical. So, it, you know, it lowers the density. But um, the, the, the point is that you still had to pay for the information. So because Wikipedia didn't have to pay for the information, no matter how good, you know, the Microsoft and Carta and Carta was or Britannica Online was, because it was free, it was it or uh, because Wikipedia was free, they were doomed as soon as Wikipedia basically started. So that's my hypothesis. Obviously, Wikipedia had to have the good uh, user interface, good marketing, good whatever. But I think the the headstone or what was it called, the keystone or the, the headstone, I forget what it was called, but the 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 part of the stone where everything else uh, connects um, is, in my opinion, the the density of the revenue form, which is free. So. The second example of low density beating high density is with Blockbuster and Netflix. So um, Blockbuster used to charge up to $4 per title for a few days worth of rentals, and they used to charge daily fees as well for items. So um, yeah, if you want to rent three movies, it's going to cost you you know 12 bucks, and then if you're late for each one of them together, it's probably going to cost you 8 bucks in late fees every single day. So that adds up extremely quickly. Especially also, you just only have like three, three movies to choose from, so that's not a lot. But... Um, Blockbuster's um, peak years are said to be around 94 to 04, and it was founded in 1985. Um, and this was in the beginning of the internet. Yet again, I said around 95 is a year of, of the internet, people usually say. Interestingly enough, um, Blockbuster actually started online streaming before Netflix, but its business model was still per title like in retail stores instead of having a flat monthly fee. This will give Blockbuster a density of 6 to 7. So the reason why Blockbuster gets a, a score of six to seven and not necessarily ten, because even then, it was, even though it was still ninety four and 04, people still were able to record on their own with their with their VHSs, or they were able to still watch TV or still watch movies on you know their cable on their cable or you know public t television. So it wasn't like Blockbuster was the only place to watch media or movies. So it can't be a ten, but um, it's still going to be a, a higher density or closer to mid density, but just um, higher mid density, I guess six or seven. Um, because essentially there, it is, it, it beat its competition. You know, you have to think about the retail stores at the, at the time, they were everywhere. So because they were everywhere physically, you would be able to go there. And like, yet again, I said, higher density, um, organizations typically tend to, uh, um, benefit from economies of scale, which that is, you could 100% you argue that Blockbuster had economies of scale in terms of its, um, physical retail stores. So that's why I give it a, a, a six to seven, but well, yeah, this was interesting too because I didn't realize that um, Blockbuster actually started its online service before Netflix. I had I had no idea that because I, I always heard that Netflix was trying to sell themselves to Blockbuster. But I guess um, when I, I researched Blockbuster's online, yet again, was still per title. So could you imagine? Well, I guess YouTube's tried to tries to do that with the YouTube stuff. They try to sell like you know two dollar, three dollar movies on YouTube. But who pays for that? You know, that's ridiculous. But um, yes, that's what they try to do. Um, in, in um, since I guess ninety. Uh, I forgot exactly when Blockbuster Online started. I forgot. I did look that up. But I forgot. But regardless, let's continue. So, um, and this is a um, uh, boy. This is an image of Hulu. 
So on the other hand, um, Netflix would have had a density of maybe 2.5 to 3 roughly when it initially gained popularity and overtaken Blockbuster, which is said to be around 2011. Uh, and my opinion is that this was because uh, Netflix only really had um, Redbox, which which is still around, I think. But um, which, if if you guys know, this was up updated Blockbuster essentially. This is like the vending machine for Blockbuster essentially, um, and Hulu to compete with. And in 2011, it had 44% of the market share in online video slash movie streaming, so it had a huge uh, chunk. And if you remember, even back then, Hulu back then really wasn't. I mean. I don't know how to explain it to you. There's a difference between like Target and Kmart or something like that. Like that, that, that was the difference, you know. Whole Foods and the gas station, basically. That's, that's kind of how it was. But uh, so because of all the um, price increases, lack of novelty, and increase in competition from Disney Plus and Prime Video uh, primarily, um, Netflix's uh, market share has dropped to 25% in 2022, and its density is now around the four and five area. The revenue form would be considered um, online video subscription. So. Yeah, the reason uh, I remember back then, it was really, really a revolutionary thing, the Netflix stuff, because yeah, every you always had to pay so much for 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 Blockbuster, and God forbid you get you gave them a, a a DVD scratched or God forbid something like that, you're paying money for it, and it's just you know it, that adds up super quickly. I remember that it was only eight bucks a month or something like that, seven bucks a month, something like that for Netflix, and you could watch all those movies, all of those shows, and they just had everyone because you know. Yet again, it's only really Hulu and Netflix. There's nothing else. So, um, yeah, it was way better. It was, it was even better than cable. So um, that's why I was giving such a such a low score. But it wasn't free, so you still had to pay for it. It wasn't like YouTube at this time. YouTube would still have a density of maybe one one and a half. Uh, yeah, you say one and a half or one one and a half because you still have to watch ads when it's free. But you know, it still is way, way, way lesser than cable television, which probably has maybe a six or seven, as well as a blockbuster. So, but nowadays, you know, as with time, you know, things you know become less and less novel. The video subs the subscription model now is played out as played out as it can get. So, um, yeah, that's why now it's no longer a two and five; it's now a three because what else is the what is the competitive advantage of the subscription model from Netflix compared to a Disney compared to Prime Video? And there's none. They're essentially they're um, identical, pretty much. So now to the so what. It's in my strongest opinion that for the very first time, cryptocurrency allows for negative densities. So negative densities mean that despite a company that despite a company that's offering um, a good or service, despite what a company is offering as a good or service, the ultimate deciding factor for commerce will be the specific token associated with business. And so that's why. Um, oh, let me just continue. Um, it's my um, opinion as well that because cryptocurrencies are automatic and trustless, we'll be able to. We will be seeing an influx of the nano pricing revenue form. Um, this would be the per smallest unit of usage type of revenue form that will allow for users to only ever be charged for what they use and not not any excess like in the, in the uh, subscription revenue forms. So, um, for example, people don't watch Netflix twenty four seven throughout the month, but um, they still have to pay um, for the entire thirty days worth of services. So, there. So, if you watch, you know, only one hour per month or a hundred hours per month, you're still charged the same amount, but Obviously, you only use you know one hour versus a hundred. You understand? So, um, I think that basically the nano pricing model is going to charge you per minute that you watch or per hour you watch or something like that. And you see that already with, um, for example, ChatGPT. They pay you per usage. So you always see that you always see the per usage, and you're already seeing that in fiat. But it's way more um, sensible within crypto because it's automatic, and you don't have to put a credit card, you don't have to do anything like that, and it could be smart contract enabled as well. Um, and yeah, so negative densities as well. Um, basically, just put so instead of Wikipedia, right, being at a 0, 0.0, I think that a negative density. So, for example, if I had my or if Everpedia, for example, if Everpedia, you know, would pay people ever or or if people could upload to Everpedia their their uh, you know articles and whatnot, and per people who um, watch Everpedia or who 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 read the um, the little articles. You know, if if the people who uploaded the articles get paid X amount of Everpedia, and very specifically the Everpedia coin was appreciating very very highly, only then do I believe that Wikipedia could ever be overtaken. So basically, if, if there's a financial reason as well, independent of what the actual good or service is. So if I'm making a whole bunch of money over here, but if I was just a Wikipedia contributor, I made zero dollars and zero cents. That's what I mean in terms of a negative density, where it's independent of the good or service. So hopefully you understand. Um, 
So an example of Netflix, if they A, release a Netflix token that was paid out and release a Netflix token when they first were, uh, they first came out or in earlier days, you know, 2010, 2009, whatever. So if they release a Netflix token that was paid out instead of USD, for example, for leasing to all title owners for every minute of watch time that they earned and charge user users, and I use an example here of 0 0.0019, so it's a sub penny price per unit of usage, and we do the math, it equals $1,000 per year if, if um, the Netflix was used 24-7 of 365. So um, I believe that this would have eliminated Disney taking their titles off of Netflix and onto Disney+. Plus. Just imagine if Disney earned Bitcoin for every single minute that the Avengers, Phineas and Ferb, Lion King, Wizards of Waverly Place, um, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, Aladdin, anything Mickey Mouse, Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, Thor, all those, um, you know, all those movies and shows were all streamed. Could you imagine how much that would be worth today? So that's essentially what I'm just trying to say. So instead of Bitcoin, imagine if there was a Netflix coin back in 2011. How much money would that be worth today if you, if, if um, you know, a whole, what was it, 2011, 2013, was that 12 years, 12 years later? Yeah, I think if that would have existed, that would have prevented Disney from um, taking their movies and stuff off of, uh, off of Netflix. So Despite owning their own their own titles and perhaps wanting to start their own Disney token in 2019, I use that year because that was um, the same year that Disney Plus started. They already have roughly 10 years worth of Netflix token appreciation that we based off of their own titles and all non-Disney titles that Netflix holds in their possession. So, as you know, Netflix created all of the, um, for example, Narcos or all the original series as well. That would have added to um, the value of the Netflix token that Disney held. So. Structurally, Netflix would, would have been able to provide more value for Disney than Disney would have been itself with its own titles because Netflix had obviously all of Disney, but then not all of maybe, or all, but a lot of DreamWorks or a lot of ESPN or a lot of documentaries, comedy specials, etc. So uh, this means that if Disney wanted to move out of the Netflix circle, their Netflix token holdings as well that they earned for the whole 10-year period, give or take, um, would also decrease in value all those being equal because if they take their shows off of you know Netflix obviously the Netflix brand would, would decrease in value fundamentally speaking so it, it would be a uh, disincentive both because they own it and also because if they wanted to or and own it by I mean the Netflix token not their own titles is a disincentive because they own the Netflix tokens that um, that they they're they're more they're more incentivized to grow the Netflix brand themselves. Um, because they they're part owners or kind of like independent owners, if you want to take and want to say, but in terms of uh, token supply, not necessarily of equity, um, then they wouldn't take out because it's a financial um, financial burden on them, essentially like that. So, hope you guys get that. Um, so, future outlook. Um, so this this is towards the end of the the presentation here. But so assuming that business competitiveness continues, let me just make sure my battery is good. Oh yeah, my battery is. Um, that's gonna die soon. Hopefully, I can do this. So, um, let's go back. All right. So, so assuming that business competitiveness continues and that lower financial densities will outcompete their higher density counterparts, to me, it's only natural that we'll be moving towards a cryptocurrency integrated economic and business environment here on out. And I call this move for modern capitalism, crypto globalism. And you see on the right, this is AI generated, by the way. Um, I'm learning a lot about the AI stuff. So a few of the images you saw today are AI generated. And this one is as well. Um, but yeah. So crypto globalism in layman's terms basically means the belief that currency can be managed optimally at a individual or corporate level because businesses are forced to compete with one, one another's uh, respective tokens in order to survive. And the economic definition is global cryptocurrency integrated mercantilism with capitalist tendencies highlighted by the mass volume and size of competitive microeconomies. And um, basically, this just means that, you know, in the same way how we understand how the reason why the private sector, you know, within capitalism versus communism, for example, the reason why we value the private sector so much is because the private sector is far more efficient overall compared to the public sector because, you um, there's incentive for companies to give you the best products that they can at the cheapest prices they can at the fastest speed that they can, whatever, because that's literally how they survive. Like they, they have to, because, um, they need the revenue and they need, the, they need the profit. So my hypothesis is that instead of having businesses, you know, operate on profit and competing against one another, if they competed on, against one another in terms of token performance. So essentially appreciation, that would be a far better, um, 
far better economic system because instead of profits, which are um, privately held between only a few people, you know, the business, the CEO, the shareholders, whatever, the the, the appreciation, such as a Netflix token, would have been on the blockchain. And the blockchain is globally um, accessible. So um, imagine if a Netflix and Amazon and Disney Plus right now were all competing for appreciation. You know, we wouldn't be um, the the no matter which company wins, we all win in terms of, um, you know, the global environment because they're fighting for appreciation, meaning that one is going to go at least somewhat slow and one medium slow. And then I guess that one, one the highest rate, but either way, they're all appreciating upwards. So um, it's not like where right now, no matter if you support Netflix, Amazon or Disney Plus, you're not making any of the profit back. You're not doing anything like that. You're just a customer. That's whatever. They just take your money and that's it. So this is a way for people to... Um, grow with the business in a very uh, holistic way it's not going to be a you know let's tax the rich or whatever it's just simply put you know i believe this company is going to exist in five or ten years so i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy its token because i know everyone else is going to need the netflix token to access netflix so i would have it's way better than owning stock as well because the stock has to do with the actual performance of the business the cash flows the assets whatever very but very specifically and if it's a corporate token um it will be it will be the revenue of the business essentially so um, yeah, and then if you guys know um, what mercantilism is, mercantilism basically is um, the economic model that was before um, capitalism, and basically it was the um, model and, and thesis basically saying that um, the the key to wealth is a, 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 an amassment, amassments or a collection of um, metals essentially. So whichever country had the most gold or silver metals, whatever. Um, would be considered the most powerful because they're able to buy the most things and whatnot. So my whole point is that it's going to be um, cur cryptocurrency integrated mechanicalism, which basically means that instead of everyone trying to fight for gold and silver, everyone will be fighting for their own token um, on the blockchain, essentially. And so and, and so that's and, and that's how that works. And um, it's capitalist tendencies by mass volume and size of competitive microeconomies. So it basically just means by a whole bunch of different businesses all competing against one another with their own tokens or with their own group of tokens, essentially. And um, was that it? Um, let's see if that was it. I guess it was. So um, thank you guys for watching um, this video um, of financial density. And hopefully you guys found it found it uh, interesting. Um, yeah, and there's going to be many more to come um, this month and also just in the future. And uh, I'm not sure what else what, I, what I'm going to do right next. Um, I have a few prepared already, so somewhat prepared. So I might just finish those up and give, it, give those to you guys. But if not... Um, well, not if not, but when that happens, um, you guys will be notified on the Discord and whatnot. So let me let me know what you guys thought about this um, topic. Uh, let me know if you guys think that this is real or whatnot. Uh, let me um, also tell me what you think about uh, crypto globalism as well. Um, I definitely believe that this is the most equitable way because, you know, and this is my closing remarks where it's like, you know, within capitalism, we're always talking about, you know, how, you know, all the money and resources, you know, accumulate to the top. But the whole point is that, you know, we, as uh, as a general public, you know, we are the reason why these companies are, and not, we're not going to talk about billionaires or multi-billionaires, whatever, just the reason why these companies are successful is because ultimately people purchase from them. So the question is, why isn't engaging with the company also economic beneficial for us? Why is it, why is it that you specifically have to own the business for you to, to reap any economic benefit from participating in the business? You know, that's a very singular look point so our people looking point or perspective i guess um so it's just you know this is way better than ubi as well um because you know where does universal basic income um you know the idea that everyone should get you know one thousand dollars a month two thousand dollars a month where does that come from you know and they're talking about taxing the taxing the profits of the of the businesses or whatever but that's that's inefficient and also taxing people who are rich are are going to disincentivize people from ever becoming rich so the whole point is that if you did it automatically which is like i said through the crypto and very specifically through the revenue which is top line which is if you look at you know pnl revenue is always going to be the highest number um uh, gross revenue i guess um you know you you're splitting the pie between everyone globally on a blockchain for free you know I don't see how that's. I don't see how that couldn't be any more efficient, essentially. And um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I discovered this maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, and now I'm finally able to um, talk about it in a more um, compact way, compact manner, and precise manner. So I'm very happy to share this with you guys. And um, yeah, until next time, catch you guys later.